they were, they were with a realtor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, if you don't mind, we want to take some pictures because we think it will really enhance the value of, of the properties that we're managing mm -hmm. to know that there's a bookstore. And I said, huh, but you were just going to save $5 mm -hmm. by buying it elsewhere, not recognizing the value of the property by having this mm -hmm. space. Well, forget just the financial value. What about the cultural value? What about you know, the, the possibilities that it speaks to our young people to have mm -hmm. a space like this mm -hmm. that they can go to? Is that you want to save five dollars, right? So, like acknowledging, of course, the money question is different, yeah. but value is a is a decision we're making all the time. Yeah. Uh, Well, hello. I want to welcome you guys again to Crooked Courage. It's been a minute and I'm so excited because today we have on Crooked Courage, Jeff. And Jeff is the director of the Seminary Co-op 57th Street Bookstore. And so it's good to have uh, Jeff on our show today. Um, I am excited about having him. I I'm a little bit biased. I love books. And so the idea that we get to have a, a bookseller and a director of a bookstore is really, really exciting. I think that much of our church and much of this community is very into reading and the book and et cetera. So it's good to have you with us today, Jeff. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's an absolute honor to be here. I appreciate you taking the time. Good, good. So, you know, one of the first places I experienced when I came to Chicago over 20 plus years ago is, of course, 57th Street Co-op. I mean, it's just like one of those stopping grounds and what a wonderful experience. But I wonder how it got its name. It seems like it's a two part name, like it's Seminary Co-op, it's 57th Street Bookstore. And when I think of seminary, I think of theological education, right. being a pastor, you know, that word kind of is triggering. So I just wanted to um, ask you as a beginner question, like how did we get the title? Right, uh, it's a great question. So there were, um, there were Three words in the name, which is Seminary Co-op Bookstore, uh, and then there's a second store that's 57th Street Books, and for those who don't know, it's about a thousand yards between them, so there's an East Wing and a West Wing. Um, the Seminary Co-op was founded in 1961 by students at the Chicago Theological Seminary, and it was founded as a member-owned cooperative, and it was founded in order to get obscure books cheaply as wholesalers, recognizing that that structure could actually do that for the students. Um, over the years, so we're celebrating our 60th anniversary this year, it grew into a community bookstore and a tremendous collection of academic books that weren't religious per se. Still a very strong religion section. Um, it, in 2013, I believe, it might be 2012, uh, the bookstore moved out of the seminary and mm -hmm. into its current location on 57th and Woodlawn, just north of the Roby House. Uh, and so it is no longer in the seminary building. In 2019, it transferred from a co-op into a not-for-profit, and we're currently the first and only not-for-profit bookstore in the country whose mission is book selling. Mm -hmm. So we're no longer a cooperative, but we're still a bookstore, which is really important to us, and just books. Mm -hmm. um, in 1983, we opened 57th Street Books, uh, and took over from the Stavers, who ran a bookstore in that space, mm -hmm. uh, and that has become one of our one of my great pleasures is uh, to be able to uh, operate a store like that, which has an amazing children's section. It's a community-facing bookstore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, together, these stores are the only general interest bookstores on the South Side, from Pilsen to Beverly, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we take that very seriously and. Uh, acknowledge that our community, first and foremost, is the south side of Chicago, mm -hmm. not just Hyde Park and not as broad as Chicago, but mm -hmm. the south side of Chicago. So, so I heard you say that it that you guys have gone to be a not for profit, which makes me assume you were for profit. What does that mean to the average person that just wants to pick up a book? Like, you right. know, that's a great question. One of the things that doesn't mean is that so we're not a 501c3 so i want to say that very clearly so we're not uh not tax deductible uh donate donations we pay our taxes uh, we're not for profit corporation hopefully what that means to the average person is that the experience of the bookstore itself mm -hmm. will be a little bit different um, if they've never been in the our bookstore mm -hmm. if they have been coming for years it shouldn't change anything but most bookstores now the ones that are left 
have so many items that aren't books for sale mm -hmm. because the business model is such where the sale of books, especially books that are written for the ages or books that are maybe written by underrepresented voices or mm -hmm. books written by small press authors, published mm -hmm. by small presses, they're not as profitable. Um, and so we are trying to create an experience of browsing and discovery that is not easily replicable, mm -hmm. certainly not in a business setting. Um, we have not made a profit for uh, since 1994. So we've actually been a non, uh, not for profit enterprise for all that time. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I don't even know what year it is, 25 years uh, mm -hmm. uh, plus. Um, and this shift in 2019 was really an acknowledgement that we're not pretending to do this mm -hmm. for the money. So let's create a structure that actually can support this, where community funding is a part of it, where decisions that are not good business decisions, but mm -hmm. great cultural decisions, actually are rewarded by the, by the structure. So, you know, I was reading somewhere that you guys are the bookstore for the serious reader, um, as opposed to, I don't know, the non-serious. <laughs> So, um, I mean, I guess my question would be is, who is your audience? That's a lot you hear in marketing. you got to have an audience. Right, it right. can't just be everybody, but that you have somebody in mind. So, say right. a little bit more about who your audience is and how do you uh, play to that audience. Right. right. And um, so, the serious reader is definitely something we think about quite a bit at the seminary co-op, specifically. Um, all readers are great readers and serious readers, and it's, it's certainly not a... Uh, question of snobbery for us. We want to be very conscientious mm -hmm. that all readers are welcome at both stores. Mm -hmm. However, there are unique needs for not just the scholar, but the serious general reader, the thinker, um, someone who is searching for meaning and purpose separate from entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, and books that are entertaining are amazing. We love selling those books, so it's not, but it's a, different in kind, a difference in kind. Uh, and that places that cater to, bookstores that cater specifically to those serious readers are exceedingly rare. Uh, and so that responsibility feels important to us. And we want to ensure that the books that we stock our shelves with mm -hmm. are not just serious, sure, um, but what do we mean by that? We mean meaningful, uh, uh, beautiful, uh, challenging, uh, potentially subverting narratives. Uh, it might be a little bit difficult to have a narrative subverted mm -hmm. um, that we've taken, we've grown up in or taken great comfort in. Those sorts of things are very different than a mm -hmm. bookstore that's about uh, you know, more entertaining topics, whether it's a beach read or mm -hmm. a celebrity biography. Amazing, like, nothing wrong with those. Uh, we sell plenty of those, uh, but it's a different kind of reader. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So how did you become a bookseller? Like at seven years old, did you say, I want to be a bookseller. That's what I want to do with my life. Like, how did you, how did you get to this space? I, I so appreciate that question. And I, I will answer first by saying, if we do our jobs right as this not-for-profit institution, there will be a seven-year-old one day who says, I want to be a bookseller. That doesn't exist right now because we don't really have a profession of bookselling uh, in American culture. There are other cultures that do. Um, so no, nobody grows up wanting to be a bookseller. Um, I grew up in a house of books in a culture that really um, like privileged books and spaces for books and learning uh, and uh, ended up not staying in that culture. It was an Orthodox Jewish uh, environment. Mm -hmm. Um, where we were studying all the time. Everyone had books everywhere. Um, but I took that with me when I, when I left the tradition. And uh, it, as a teenager, I worked in libraries. I was a page for libraries. Mm -hmm. And I knew that there were essentially two spaces that I could see myself spending my days. Mm -hmm. One was out of doors. I loved being outside. Mm -hmm. And the other one was in a bookish space. Uh, the idea of working in an office or any you know, downtown or anything like that mm -hmm. was... Um, I, I couldn't imagine it. Uh, so as, as a young man, I started uh, entry level as a bookseller, thought I'd do it for a little while until I figured things out, and here I am a quarter century later, uh, having spent my entire career in bookselling, mm -hmm. um, and I've done it throughout the country. So I uh, was on the West Coast for most of my career, uh, most recently in Oakland, California, uh, and loved it out there. Uh, but when my predecessor, Jack Sella, who was a Hyde Park legend, 
who uh, was in his role for 43 years. Mm -hmm. We should all have these, these sorts of uh, mm -hmm. uh, careers. He retired and there was a national search in 2013. Mm -hmm. And I moved to Chicago just uh, because the, these bookstores, as far as I'm concerned, are the best in the country. Mm -hmm. um, what this community, along with Jack and the booksellers, have built in those bookstores, uh, it's, it's remarkable. And I've told the Hyde Park community many times since I've started uh, how spoiled they are, mm -hmm. uh, that they should have a seminary called 57th Street Books and Powell's Books, all within walking distance, and then a Blackstone Library and the Regenstein Library, all of these amazing book spaces that most communities don't have any. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I feel very uh, privileged to uh, steward them for a little while uh, for the next generation. Yeah, yeah. Um, bookstores, definitely 57th Street is, is high up. I, I think of it as all one uh, bookstore. Good. Um, so do we. We've seen a change in how people read. Um, so a lot of things that were once on paper have gone digital. Um, and so it, it's been sad to see how many bookstores have closed, actually. That's right. um, and definitely the for-profit ones, uh, you know, Borders, mm -hmm. uh, Barnes and Nobles is surviving, mm -hmm. but definitely has closed a lot of bookstores. And even some independent bookstores have just like bit the dust. That's right. What do you see as the future like? What do you see as the future of the Seminary Co-op 57th Street Bookstore? Is there a future, do you, with this, it's funny because it's like there's a decline in the church too. <laughs> you know, and right. we're rethinking, right. um, seeing that this is important. I'm sure you feel it's important. Um, but what do you think about digital books and, mm -hmm. you know, what's the future of? Yeah, that's such a great question and thank you for that. I think the parallels with the church are very interesting. Um, and there's a separate question about the digital book that um, I'll touch on, but I think you know, in, in really uh, like planning for the future and thinking about the future, uh, first of all, it's remarkable that we're still here. Uh, mm -hmm. Video stores are long gone. Um, record stores, thankfully, we have a record store uh, down, just down the Spoiled street. Spoiled again. <laughs> Spoiled again is right. Uh, but those are mostly gone. Uh, and yeah, and, and people aren't even buying re records or CDs at all. It's mm -hmm. all streaming. Um, and what's lost when those spaces are lost? Uh, we recognize that the model that we have inherited from traditional retail mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to run these stores is not a model any of us would have built. And this is why we went not for profit. So our, our assumption is with the shift in how we think and talk about bookstores as a community, we actually could preserve what's best about them and not try and preserve the things that never quite made sense anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so in thinking about you know, Barnes & Noble, which uh, is a wonderful <laughs> company and they do great work. We have a Barnes & Noble in the community on campus on top mm -hmm. of it. It's a very good Barnes & Noble uh, at the University of Chicago. They sell a lot of uh, other things, you know, uh, board games and, and things that mm -hmm. are all good things, but are also sell, sold elsewhere. They don't have this model that is just supporting books. And so that to us, and it's counterintuitive because it's the thing that makes us the least amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we lose money in selling books. That's why it's a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that is what our cultural good, uh, mm -hmm. our cultural value is for the community. And ultimately, bookish spaces in the landscape are critical to an engaged, informed citizenry. And we know this, we've seen it. We've seen uh, you know, children grow up in these stores mm -hmm. and see the difference of what uh, all of the ideas that they encounter and all of the people they see who are so excited to just grab a book and go, you mm -hmm. know, and open mm -hmm. it and read it and can't wait to read another one as opposed to just mindlessly scrolling through their phone or taking mm -hmm. in other mm -hmm. media that is um, a bit more vapid. Uh, look, ephemeral media is great, uh, entertainment's mm -hmm. important, but at some point things can be relatively vapid. I think that you know, the mm -hmm. church is a great organization to remind us that like, there's some greater meaning in, in the world, and we would do well to spend time considering that mm -hmm. alongside the other things we're doing. Um, so it's a very long-winded way of saying I am very optimistic about the future of bookstores mm -hmm. if we focus on the things that only we can do. 
uh, which are creating these bookish spaces, privileging books, again, underrepresented voices, books that have been published throughout the ages, not just mm -hmm. uh, our mm -hmm. time, books that are published in different places, uh, mm -hmm. wisdom of other mm -hmm. uh, communities that are being brought in. If we put all of those books in one spot, invite community in, and open the door so it's democratic, that mm -hmm. uh, feels very important. So two other quick points. One is, um, Libraries are something I, I spend a lot of time in libraries, and I absolutely mm -hmm. love libraries. Uh, and I also feel strongly that libraries, uh, first of all, these are complementary institutions, but I look forward to libraries all being able to be just bookish spaces as well. Um, and I think that it's incredible the amount of services that they offer. Um, mm -hmm. But to mm -hmm. think about the actual word itself, library, containing book uh, mm -hmm. in, in the mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. um, and that even libraries are no longer able to just focus on books because there are so many other services that we're neglecting mm -hmm. to offer elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's you know, internet access or mental health services or any, any number of other uh, things, that we really don't even have any places that are just for books. But mm -hmm. What could we do if libraries, bookstores, and other bookish spaces, all with an open door, mm -hmm. democratic, anyone can come in, what, what could we do for our public discourse, our ability mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. talk to each other, uh, our ability to be alone uh, and engaged in meaningful thought and rumination, that all feels important. I didn't touch about on digital books, but I'll leave it there. Oh, gosh, yeah. I feel like already I need a second interview. Um, uh, you're really charismatic. <laughs> um, so um, we, we both have this love of books. Right, we got a, a book love affair kind of thing going on. What are some other things? I'm going to switch the flavor, the tempo a little bit. What are some other things you love as passionately as books? That's a great question. Uh, there's very little um, beyond, <laughs> beyond the humans in my life. I mean, I love the humans in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love music and I play music, and uh, that gives me great joy. Um, my partner is a gardener, I mean, gardener and artist does 10,000 things, um, mm -hmm. but sells seedlings at the 61st Street Farmer's Market, and um, I am terrible at all of it, but I love uh, you know, helping her out and being a part of that mm -hmm. uh, that world, uh, and spending time, as I said, out of doors. We spend a lot of time out of doors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and doing that feels amazing. So um, all of those things, but uh, it would probably be astonishing to tell you how much time I spend either thinking about books, thinking about book selling, talking to other readers, mm -hmm. like that is so consuming and it's so energizing mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I don't have much need for all that much else, frankly. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's a book that, that shifted your life? Um, there's so many. Uh, I think the first one that comes to mind is a book called The Tao Te Ching, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is, I believe, Still the most translated book. Uh, it's mm -hmm, uh, the mm -hmm. Bible's number two, surprisingly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, a uh, book of ancient Chinese wisdom uh, that's the cornerstone of Taoism. Uh, and it is a book that is so. I read it when I was 18. Um, mm -hmm. I should say I understood it when I was 18. I read it when I was 16 and 17 and didn't understand it, but I knew there was something there for me. And I read it when I was 18, and it completely shifted the course of my life. Mm -hmm. um, and it speaks to acceptance, acknowledgement of the way of the world, uh, and becoming a part of it, because we are a part of it, uh, mm -hmm. in a way that has kept me, um, uh, em helped me embrace what is. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, learning to love, there's a, a line, you know, learning to see as beautiful what is necessary in things, mm -hmm. that has always felt really important to me. It's not mm -hmm. from the Dao Te Ching, it's from a different book, but that idea of, um, learning to see as beautiful, mm -hmm. that which you can't change. Mm -hmm. so. One of your favorite bookstores, you don't have to, you don't have to go politically. And say oh, there's nothing so. political at all, though. Um, I can, I can, I, this is a great question. So in, in the neighborhood, I mean, I, so I love Pilsen Community Books. I actually have a bag of theirs uh, with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, one of the books. And Powell's books, like those are the, the two bookstores I go to the most. Pilsen? Mm-hmm. It's a bookstore. Mm -hmm. okay. It's relatively new. It's about five years old. Okay. Um, and both Powell's and Pilsen are used books, so that should tell you when I'm, you know, uh, out shopping for myself, I know all the new books that are coming out, um, I can get them, I, I love going to used bookstores. Uh, I think Chicago has a wealth of great, great stores. I love Women and Children First, and I love Unabridged yeah. Books. Um, 
in the suburbs in Oak Park, there's an amazing store called The Book Table, no, um, right. which mm -hmm. was uh, is um, owned by a, a Hyde Park Hyde Park kid. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's an adult now, but a uh, Hyde Park kid. Uh, and then throughout the country, um, I, I mean, I can go on about this, uh, but I'll name just a few stores. Um, there's a store called Source Booksellers in Detroit, mm -hmm. um, run by Allison and Janet Jones, and they are, uh, I mean, it is, it is another, like, book for, uh, books are for serious readers, mm -hmm. uh, it's almost entirely nonfiction, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of university press titles, and they are just, they're the best. Um, there's a bookstore called Moe's in Berkeley, it's a used mm -hmm. bookstore that was, mm -hmm. like, essentially my favorite place to get lost when I was in Oakland, uh, and I've been going there for mm -hmm. decades and love it. So anyway, I can go on, and, I, and I'll tell you that the bookstore, there really are very few bookstores I don't love going to. It could be a, mm -hmm. a, a shack, it could be a cart, and mm -hmm. I, the experience of browsing and discovery uh, is always really special. So. so I'm going to ask you, this just came off the top of my head, mm -hmm. do you ever buy a book from Amazon.com? Never. <laughs> well, well, not only, I didn't think, not only, I didn't think let on let me, let, me just, let, me just, let me just restate that. I, I, just ne I never buy anything from Amazon.com. Right. I refuse to buy anything from them. I don't begrudge anyone who does. There are a lot of reasons people do. I would never, ever give them a penny of my money unequivocally. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I take that seriously. And I, I think that there are decisions I make every day, like all of us do, mm -hmm. that are morally compromised in terms of how we spend our money. And so there's no, um, I'm not uh, by any means uh, elevating, you know, my purchasing decisions. I, I thoughtlessly spend money often, but I know, I know enough. I know enough, and mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. very strongly, for me personally, that it's the wrong decision. Um, and I'm interested, because of that, I'm interested in learning from others, uh, you know, what, what, what our purchasing decisions mean. And, you know, if there's one thing that the pandemic has taught us, uh, one thing, there's so many things, but one thing that was immediately obvious to everyone to whom it wasn't obvious already, which many, to many of us it was, is just how interdependent we all are and how much we mm -hmm. need each other. Mm -hmm. And to think about how much money Amazon has made just in the pandemic and yeah. uh, to think, well, they were saviors for us because they were able to deliver. They were able to deliver because they completely depleted a landscape that would have been able to deliver otherwise. Mm -hmm. And they did it in a way that frankly was decidedly inhumane. Uh, and there are some great books about it I could recommend to <laughs> anyone who wants to learn more about it. No, uh, no, and no. I, I, I'm saying this carefully because I, frankly, I, I have like strong feelings about not ever speaking ill, ill of others. I just want to speak mm -hmm. well of uh, what we do. But since you asked, I couldn't resist. And, uh, no, no, and no. they're in the news right now. And there's a, actually a book that came out this week called uh, Fulfilled. Um, that speaks exactly to this of what the cost of a one-click model is and what we've given up for convenience and what we call low prices, but are actually uh, they're actually not low prices because our communities are, are devastated by what companies like this are doing. And if I could just one last thing, because you asked about it, think about the money that was offered to mm -hmm. Amazon to build their warehouse here. And what, what if we took that money and we invested it in small businesses mm -hmm. and in community organizations? What could we bring by way of jobs and wealth mm -hmm. to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd I certainly be curious to see that uh, that experiment. Uh, I think we could do very well. So um, th thanks for asking. And sorry, I hope that wasn't negative. I, no, uh, no, uh, no, I no. I mean, it's definitely a good answer. I think that, like you say, we are walking contradictions. And so what we believe in what we, and, and how we live that out sometimes contradicts. So like one of my mentors is like, I know that Walmart is terrible, but I still sometimes end right up in, you know, so I mean, we do have to navigate. Um, um, our choices are powerful, um, and so we have to navigate that. So it's good to hear. I think when you walk into 57th Street, a bookstore, you are, it's about relationship and you're making a conscious choice because you right. know that you are paying, you know, this price and that, you know, the book is important to you. That's right. And so you have to know that. I think we um, have been pimped, and so it is tempting when you see, I can get this book on Amazon for this price, right. you know, and for people who, um, I think as I get older, I'm, I'm able to make the decision more that I'm going to pay the extra cost, but I had to kind of evolve to right. that point. Well, I think for those who, who can't and are focusing just, right. uh, like, of course, yeah. um, 
but for anyone who is interested in having, uh, I, I can tell you a, a brief anecdote. I was at 57th Street Books, and there were two people who were there for the first time. And I, anytime I say anyone for the first time, I'm like, hey, let me show you. This is like, welcome. And mm -hmm. it's five, five rooms. Come see it. It's so magical. Mm -hmm. And they were thrilled. And I showed them a few books, and they were excited. And I later on, I heard one say to the other, oh, this one's $5 cheaper on Amazon. I'll just get it there. And they put it down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I approached them a few minutes later. I said, I couldn't help but hear the, overhear the conversation. Mm -hmm. I completely mm -hmm. understand. But I see that your bags are with, uh, I won't say who it was, but they were, they were, they were, they were, they were with a realtor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, if you don't mind, we want to take some pictures because we think it will really enhance the value of, of the properties that we're managing mm -hmm. to know that there's a bookstore. And I said, huh, but you were just going to save $5 mm -hmm. by buying it elsewhere, not recognizing the value of the property by having this mm -hmm. space. Well, forget just the financial value. What about the cultural value? What about... You know, the, the possibilities that it speaks to our young people to have mm -hmm. a space like this mm -hmm. that they can go to is that you want to save five dollars right so like acknowledging of course the money question is different yeah. but value is a, is a decision we're making all the time yeah. uh, and we don't think twice about spending twenty dollars on a couple of lattes and croissants no we no, want to no. save five dollars on the greatest work of literature ever written or with, you know, whatever the case may be yeah yeah definitely a good point so I like I said, we have to have you back for a second interview. Right, so I can interview you because I want I have ten thousand questions for you. I mean, well, you already interviewed me. They don't know it. I had to be interviewed to get you on. I get courage. It's called, it's called my my curiosity, and and I I think that um, probably in both of our lines of work, listening mm. is uh, mm. one of the great joys. Uh, what we get to do is to listen and ask questions, mm. uh, and if we do our jobs really well it's only because we've been good listeners so in wow. that way perhaps we have uh, a similar similar work uh, to do um, so anyway but thank you for that yeah I, I probably you too I much I much enjoy asking the question and listening than being asked the question 100%, <laughs> 100%. Um, yeah, yeah um so two last questions because I think we're probably at the end of our time mm -hmm. what's on your table um, I find that most high parkers are reading maybe three books, but you know, what's one book that's on your table at home now? Uh, I'm currently reading a book called The Subversive Simone Bay, uh, mm -hmm. which the University mm -hmm. of Chicago Press just put out, uh, and it's uh, exploring five concepts in the work of Simone Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. I just finished the attention chapter, so spending time thinking about attention and mm -hmm. what we pay attention to has been very valuable. So it's a good book. It's worth, it's worth reading. And it's, we, we have a subscription that we do now. And it's actually the choice for our religion subscription, so not to be like a shameless plug or anything, but uh, it is it is what we're currently sending out. So you guys have adopted the marketing strategy of a subscription. Mm -hmm. So that means a person pays a price and they get a book per month. Every other month, but yes. Every yes. other month? Yes. And so tell our listeners a little bit about that, like how much does it cost? What kind of book? Are you surprised by the book? Yeah, um, so recognizing that part of our work is selection and filtration. Um, we've uh, been wanting to do this for a long time and the, the pandemic has allowed us to. So it's it's currently, there's an introductory price of $199. It'll uh, actually be $250 soon enough. Uh, and it, uh, it allows one to get a bi-monthly uh, book choice and there are nine different uh, sec yeah, selections uh, that you can choose, whether religion or philosophy or literature or just general, uh, which is our front mm -hmm. table subscription. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has been immensely popular uh, and we are so excited. So we shipped our first books in January and we're shipping our second ones now. For the religion front table, we have this Simone Bay book. Uh, ah. But it has been fun and then it creates community around those who are uh, getting the subscription to know that others are reading these books alongside them. So will these people be grandfathered forever or? <laughs> <laughs> Are they going to rise with the rise? No, we'll, we'll figure that out. And as you know, we're really not good business people. Uh, yeah. So uh, all you have to do is ask, and our answer is yes. So, uh, good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so my last question awesome. is, I ask people generally that come up here on Cricket Courage, what's on your bucket list um, uh, to do? You know? I read, I read recently, I'm trying to remember where it was. Um, when you're young, you don't have a bucket list, it's just a to-do list. And at what point do you develop a bucket list? And I'm definitely of the age where I, I should have a bucket list. Um, 
Gosh. You but you don't. You told me. I, <laughs> what would um, you like to do before? I want to write a book. How about that? Hmm. I want to write a book. I'd like to I say I, I want to publish a book. I've written a lot. Uh, I'd like to publish a book. Uh, In what genre? Uh, a celebration of the bookstore and a celebration of uh, the work that we do. I, you know, mm. As you can see, I'm very passionate about, mm. about the work. Uh, and I didn't get into it because of that passion. I, mm -hmm. That passion developed over time. Wow. I got into yeah. it because... I never thought I would have to defend the work, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. booksellers are uh, under siege, as bookstores are. Um, and I think that there's a celebration to be written about what it means to do this work, what it means to a community to have these spaces, what it's meant to me to have these mm -hmm. spaces. Mm -hmm. And with some reflection time to be able to do that kind of writing would feel, I guess that would be on the bucket list. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for appearing on Crooked Courage. It's been a joy. My pleasure, truly. Uh, next time I interview you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, thank you.